define what I mean by ritualism. It was the second phase of what we call the Oxford Movement, which was a holiness movement beginning in the early 19th century in the Church of England that came to be called Anglo-Catholicism. And what ritualism was aiming to do, its clergy wanted to uh, assert the spiritual independence of the Church of England, to uh, look back and, and gain its historic resources and to galvanise its energies. They wanted a more imaginative approach to liturgy and they were into what one commentator called um, ritual, uh, ceremonial intensification and ritual elaboration. And they had a six point programme. Uh, the perfect ritualist church had six candlesticks and a crucifix on the altar. Uh, there would be uh, mixing of water and wine, there'd be the use of communion, wafer breads instead of the ordinary bread. The priest would face east for the Eucharistic prayer and he would wear Eucharistic vestments. I think we'd mix the water and wine, it's the other thing. So it was a move to uh, put the Eucharist at the centre of parish life, to displace matins and litany. That was the normal fare of Anglican parishes on Sunday morning. Uh, perhaps we go to St. Bartholomew's. This is St. Bartholomew's Brighton. It's one of the tallest churches in the Church of England. Hope to be there in a few weeks' time. Uh, they're facing east uh, and facing a crucifix in Red Six. Uh, and, and so uh, inevitably, this programme uh, beginning in the middle of the 19th century, uh, attracted opposition. Let's go to Father Tooth. This is the famous Father Tooth who was imprisoned for uh, ritual offences. Uh, under the newspaper, a magazine put this up. So um, people, oh I guess, the, the really, the two things that really got people going in response was priests recommending a regular confession to a priest uh, and also the wearing of Eucharistic vestments because those with any kind of liturgical or theological knowledge knew that this was asserting the doctrine of Eucharistic sacrifice which had been repudiated and rejected at the English Reformation. Well, uh, newspapers in New Zealand were reporting on what was happening back in England and thanks to the way in which the Evening Star and the ODT um, amply reported on all this and got lots of space in its correspondence columns, we can trace the beginnings of New Zealand anticipation of ritualism and Papers Past is a great resource for this. And looking at the correspondence, it really falls into about three or four categories. There were those who were the conspiracy theorists. Bishop Neville is intent on imposing high church clergy in this diocese. No wonder the parishes are having problems financing themselves and financing full-time ministry. The second category of correspondence were those who uh, were opposed to ritualism and were determined to nip it in the bud, any first signs of it. Clergy who intoned uh, the responses at matins and the litany was that's a bad sign. Clergy who uh, had surplus choirs and processed them in with a processional cross, this was another warning sign of bad things to come. There were also those who wanted to see the Oxford movement arrive in the Diocese of Dunedin. They wanted to see its devotion, its discipline, its attention to pastoral diligence. Um, perhaps the other thing I missed out is that ritualism and Anglican Catholicism had a powerful dose of romanticism, that powerful cultural current that dominated 19th century culture and still there very strongly for us. Hence the stress on devotion, poetry and mystery. Well, uh, that was the beginnings of the newspaper war and there were several brush fire incidents, certain opening skirmishes. Reverend H.J. Davis, vicar of Naseby, you wouldn't have think Naseby would be the first place where trouble developed, <laughs> um, was encountered, was thought to be ritualist, and um, in the year um, 1881, a vandal had broken into the church, uh, torn up the altar cloth and stolen the candlesticks. Uh, then the Reverend Hobbs had gone to All Saints Gladstone. He was opposed for ritualist practices also. Uh, and left after three years for a, a rather more quiet ministry at Gore. But when he left six years later, the Bruce Herald claimed that um, financial contributions were down and he too had uh, been dogged by controversy about all that. But the real attention getter, because these incidents were now beginning to occur up and down New Zealand, had occurred in the Diocese of Christchurch at St. Bartholomew's Kaiapoi, where the Reverend Carl Lyon had turned up in the 1870s from Cornwall and it was a case of immoderate youthful zeal encountering entrenched Orange Lodge opposition. He'd had the misfortune to come to a parish where the Orange Lodge 
were firmly ensconced in the lay leadership of the parish. I think this is supposed to be the oldest church in the Diocese of Christchurch, well <coughs> worth a visit if you're passing through Kaiathboy. And, and there were some cause celebre incidents. Uh, there was a watch night service on New Year's Eve interrupted by the banging of a drum and the ringing of a bell. People rushed outside and there was a bit of a fight and the drum got ripped. Uh, but um, what Caroline was doing, he was facing east for the Eucharistic prayer. He was mixing water with wine. He was wearing a surplus and coloured stole. He had a surplus choir. Let's notice what he wasn't doing. He wasn't wearing vestments. He wasn't using incense. But he had done two things to really get the Orange Lodge lay opposition mobilised. He had said in a sermon that the Virgin Mary was the greatest saint who ever lived. And he had also handed out um, pre-confirmation manuals um, recommending the practice of confession to a priest and with a list of searching moral inventory questions. And if there was one thing guaranteed to get the Victorian patriarch going, it was the thought that his women folk were being examined on the subject of sexual purity and uh, the priest inquiring into what was going on in the intimate affairs of the Victorian household. Well, we can notice the means used to get rid of Carlyon. Uh, they cut off their giving, a standard pack practice in New Zealand to get moved from unpopular clergy on. There were the inevitable protest meetings and resignations from vestry, but that was a double-edged sword because, of course, um, the Carlisle supporters could win the occasional tactical victories. There was complaining to the bishop, but that didn't really work because Bishop Harper upheld a number of Carlisle's practices while advising Carlisle to tone it down. But what worked was appealing to an ecclesiastical court, in other words, going one higher than Harper. And the three bishops who adjudicated on the charges brought against Carline was Souter, the new evangelical Bishop of Nelson, who was bound to find him in the wrong, uh, and Neville, who, although he was a crypto high churchman, needed to conceal all that after the Jenner affair, and that was the means to get rid of Carline. So there was a tickless now for a ritualist priest to be seen in a parish. You needed to get control of the money supply. You needed to avoid um, going to a parish with lay popes or the Orange Lodge and Scots to the lay leadership. Um, you needed to get the support of di your diocesan bishop. And you needed to stay out of the ecclesiastical courts above all. Well, if that had been the opening warning shot, uh, Dunedin would then experience in the 1880s a replay of all this with like, what I call the Kirkham curtain raiser at St. John's Roslyn. Um, the Reverend Kirkham had come out from England in 1879 to become the Vicar of All Saints to Neaton, an appointment that had fallen through, but the parish of St John's Ralston was coming into existence and so he was sent off to that parish. Three years later, the new church of St John's was consecrated and oh, he was away. He was a man of independent means. He had paid the £400 to get out here. Uh, he was moderate in the changes he made at St John's. He put a chancel screen in, some candelabra, he had a surplus choir. But where he really went to town was in the Mission Church of the Good Shepherd of Flagstaff, which we are very fortunate a photograph of. Here he wore Eucharistic vestments, he used incense, he wore a beretta, I should have brought mine with me to show what I mean by that. Um, and uh, he had a very elaborate church indeed. It became known as the go-to place for ritualist religion. People came there from as far away as St. Clair. And from 1883, a lively correspondence developed in the newspapers about the goings-on at St. John's. So there were six years of intense contestation at Roslyn. With the usual tactics being used, the financial supply being cut off, but he could withstand that with independent means. There were seven resignations from the vestry and church warden resigned. Um, there were, um, what was unusual about this was the utterly implacable nature of the opposition. Kirkham offered uh, compromises. They were rejected. We just, we want you to go. Just leave. Get out. And in the middle of all this, it became known that Kirkham's wife had converted to Roman Catholicism, which further stoked things up. Um, and so when Kirkham left in 1889, the opposition Dominic Vestry removed the chancel screen from St John's, removed the candelabra and all the other things. Bishop Neville said, put it back, and they just refused. Bishop Neville offered a compromise uh, on seven principal feast days in the year, put those things back. They sort of agreed. Those things were put in a box, and when they went to open the box later on, there were rocks there. And um, 
The crucial factor here was the elite status of the entrenched opposition to what Kirkham was trying to do. And especially signified by James Ashcroft, the official assignee of the city and a former editor of the ODT. Well, regrettably for Kirkham, he'd been the superintendent of the Sunday School at um, the Mission Church of the Good Shepherd. He'd been actively trying to undermine what Kirkham tried to do there. Kirkham sacked him, of course, and then he really got going in leading the opposition. And so it was, um, these were people who were used to getting their own way into the society and not taking uh, kindly to criticism. So when in his presidential address to the 1889 Synod, Bishop Neville criticised the Roslyn Vestry quote <coughs> for the sin of driving forth one of God's most devoted servants. Ashcroft moved an adjournment at Synod the next day in order to link, deliver a lengthy apologia for himself and the Roslyn Vestry. Well, you know, Neville was renowned for his combative and irascible manner, a formidable controversialist opponent, but Ashcroft had no compunction whatsoever about talking back to him, despite several interjections from the presidential high chair and a frosty reception from Synod. Um, there's two other sad things. One of Kirkham's sons drowned at Sinclair Beach. Another became a convert to the Reverend um, the G.C. Grubb, an international denominational missionary society, and in 1896, he was farewell from the Coral Hall as he left for Bombay with the Pune and Indian village mission. In other words, he'd become a convert to the religion of his father's opponents. Well, um, what happens next is just fast forward three or four images to, um, to uh, Ronald's inquiry, I think. Um, we're coming to St. Peter's Caversham now, and this was a parish that had been dogged by financial problems and difficulties in securing the services of a full-time vicar from its beginnings in 1864. that had been kind of a wrote, um, revolving door for Carriots until the Reverend William Ronaldson turned up. Uh, and he was determined to make a success of this ministry. It was a reasonably long stay ministry. He made the fateful decision to move St. Peter's Church, which was then a wooden church at the top of South Road, down to here in the Parkside, where the population developed was becoming much denser, and the other fateful decision was to build in brick. Uh, well, um, he had made the right decision about moving to Parkside, because this was where the population was. But he had gambled on the local Anglican community being prepared to be enthusiastic about raising all the money to build the church, and there he had made some fatal miscalculations. The move came in 1882, the year of the beginning of the, what's called the Long Depression in New Zealand's history that ran right through the 1880s and into the 1890s, and it certainly had a significant impact here. He had gambled on the land on which the former St. Peter stood, known as Clapcott's Acre, being swiftly sold to help pay for the sale. In fact, there were numerous complications and difficulties, and it didn't sell until 1902. The debt problems um, steadily mounted. Um, Ronaldson began to use his own resources. They moved two large rooms from Green Island to form the parish hall. He paid for that, 500 pounds, because that's a bit of my cash. And um, he, he was driven out of the parish, really, in 1897, I beg your pardon, 1887, uh, surrounded by bitter acrimony about the debts that had been racked up. And so Bishop Neville resolved to take decisive action to save St. Peter's. It was now in a desperate situation with very few vestry members left and huge debts. Um, so he resolved to impose uh, the Reverend Brian King on the parish. And he said in the 1915 Dawson Synod, it may not be known to all that he, King, accepted the charge of St. Peter's Caversham at my request entirely as an act of faith. This was at the time, there was a time no vestry and no stipend could be offered. He never had robust health, but his unfailing courage and manifest sincerity first attracted to his side a band of earnest ladies, and later the parish organisation was restored, the terrible debt grappled with, and as a result, a reward of many years of patient effort, the late canon had the happiness of seeing when he retired a strong and well-equipped parish, with many additions to its property and its debts reduced. Well, uh, he moved to a rental house in what we now call Loyalty Street. It was now called Brunswick Street, number 13. The house is still there. It's had a bit of a renovation to one of its side walls recently. And his perilous ministry began. Uh, we need to say a few words about King's life and ministry before that. Let's go back to... Uh, back to one. Back to one. He 
His father was, of course, the Vicar of St George's in the East, the first church where the famous ritual riots began, a series of riots that would occur up and down the length of the British Isles. And um, those riots occurred from 1859 to 1860. Uh, and there were, um, it drew in proxy supporters and opponents from all over the southeast of England. And certainly services were disrupted in this kind of a way, and police constables were sent in from time to time trying to minimise the troubles. Well, Brian King had grown up in, <coughs> in the St George's Vicarage as a teenager and witnessed all this. Um, and we wonder what he made of it all. Um, let's go on to the next image. This is his dad, after whom he was named. And uh, in the cathedral papers there, there's a hagiographical work praising Brian King as a martyr of ritualism. Not everybody had that opinion at the time. There was a lot of adverse criticism about him. John Sheldon Reed has brought all that criticism together. The Times Intelligent Report had also observed that in private life he is as remarkable for his extreme pride and hauteur as he is notorious for want of propriety and discretion in the administration of his duties. Um, Father McConaughey's biographer had said he was not without courage, he showed patience and forbearance and behaved with considerable dignity in some trying situations, but it's difficult to escape the impression he was something of a noodle. Well, later historians have been kinder to King Senior and have said that he was blamed for some of the things that other people had done. He had given permission for a mission church to be established at St Peter's London Docks, where two SSC priests had been the first to wear Eucharistic vestments in the Diocese of London and to practice an advanced style of ritualist religion. Well, he got the blame for that. And they encouraged him to wear vestments. He was a bit reluctant about that. That inflamed an already tense situation. Um, so he was moved on to the quiet living of Avebury in Wiltshire, where he did in fact show some capacity for compromise. The services there, that there were um, Holy Communion every Sunday. There was a Sun Eucharist. There was Gregorian chant to accompany it. But there was no lighted candles on the altar. He didn't wear vestments and there wasn't incense. Well, I'm going to argue, though, that one of the reasons why Brian King Jr., was successful in what he did at Cavisham, apart from the parish's desperation, was that he displayed a high degree of emotional intelligence and ability to get on with people, what we now call soft skills. And so I think he was watching and learning. Well, um, there's an interesting issue about sibling rivalry. How come this, you know, Brian King was the oldest of nine children. One of his younger brothers, Gilbert King, was sent to Oxford was the curate of this quiet country living of Avery and went on to be a vicar in Cornwall. How come he was given this preferential treatment and Brian King wasn't? What Brian King did do was to go and join the mercantile firm of George S. King based in Liverpool and Bombay. He was sent out in 1863 to Bombay to be the local branch manager and for six years successfully ran that branch, which I think gave him a background also in finance, administration, Mm. and business affairs, and also about operating in a different culture. And he came back six years later to learn how to be a priest from his dear old dad at Avebury. Uh, so uh, he then came to Australia in 1878. He was ordained in the Diocese of Perth. He um, was appointed to the parish of Greenough, and then he moved to Tasmania in 1883 to become the vicar of Greenpongs. And then, in 1885, he arrived in Dunedin to be theological tutor. Remember, Neville decided, I can't keep clergy in this diocese, we'll train them on the spots before he managed to bring Selwyn College into existence as the local theological college. And uh, he was also made curate in charge of St Martin's North East Valley and became the diocesan registrar. He was moving closer to the Nevilles all the time. Uh, so he faced major challenges in coming to this parish, but he had several advantages, the background in business administration and finance. He'd already been vicar of several parishes, he knew he could count on the unqualified support of his bishop, and he was not going to be opposed by lay popes or Orange Lodge extremists. Well, um, at first, things seemed to be going well. He reported well on how well things were going. The first crisis came in 1893, when a local finance and mortgage company threatened to foreclose on the mortgage which the parish had. Remember, the parish had borrowed in hope to build the church. 
So um, Kane was quite clever about this. He went to the Glass and Trust Board and said, we have a major problem. Why don't you give us a mortgage for £500 on favourable terms so we can pay off our more pressing debts? And that's what happened. Uh, he, uh, the next crisis came in 1894. He said to the vestry, uh, I've received no stipend for the last month. My house rental is in arrears. I'm going to resign unless you make my stipend the first claim on the debenture holders. What's a debenture? I never knew this until I started writing my thesis. It's an, um, supposing I need to raise a lot of money quickly from you people, I'd say, um, you, you, and you, can you lend me um, $500 and I'll pay you back in two years' time, and this is the rate of interest I'll, I'll, I'll uh, pay you back at. Uh, he wanted the stipend to be the first claim on that. Captain Esther, um, after whom Esther Crescent was named, was the church warden here, where for many years he volunteered to stump up more money. The debenture holders agreed to this. A strong letter of support was offered by Bishop Neville. And, and let's just say two things about what really helped King. The earnest band of ladies he talked about was the guild. In Victorian parishes and beyond that, maybe women didn't have the vote at parish meetings. My goodness, they had indispensable economic and financial power. You had to have their support because they were a cash cow who could always be counted on to stump up money and to provide a ready cash flow. And the other thing was that um, Bishop Neville was a man who put his money where his mouth was. He gave debentures to the parish as well as strongly supporting. Let's go to, to Neville's rather fearsome image. <laughs> well, you know, why haven't I dwelt on the Jenner affair? Because I think it's a sideshow. I think that you know, when Jenna was displaced as the Bishop of Dunedin, he went off to a quiet country living and wrote hymns. I think he lacked what Neville had, the drive, the energy, the determination. He had married money. I'll be talking about that at the Requiem Eucharist. And um, he made many mistakes. He hacked a lot of people off, but he never gave up. And um, it was... Despite his combative nature, I think we owe it to him that the Diocese of Dunedin came into existence. So, um, how did King set about trying to change the pattern of worship? Let's go to the vestments now. Well, frustratingly, the vestry minutes tell us nothing about this. The vicars don't actually have to consult with their vestries about worship changes, so it's a very good idea for them to do that. We do know that he wore these vestments because the newspaper report said it. And he said it about himself when he handed these vestments over to the cathedral where they now live. And they had been the vestments that his father wore at St George's in the East. We know also um, from a letter of complaint that came from Holy Cross and Kildas many years later. He said, um, at, the, at St Peter's vestments are used, services are in plain surplus, there are two altar lights, but no incense. The other services are plain. But here at Holy Cross, we're getting the works. You know, incense, the block. This is not fair. So um, what does tell us something about King's change strategy of worship registers? He began to try and reduce the number of matins and litany services in the mid to late morning as much as possible. It was a compromise at first. You know, two matins and litanies a month and two sun Eucharists. There was always an 8 a.m. Holy Communion. Frustratingly, he doesn't. He tells us what, how many communicants were at these some Eucharist. He doesn't tell us how many other worshippers were there. Did the Matins lovers just sit at these services out unrecorded? Or was there a low turnout? But he boxed on and kept slowly but surely upping the ante and increasing the number of some Eucharists. We know that Cavisham worshippers were early risers. On major feast days, they'd whack on a 7 o'clock service as well as 8 o'clock service. These were very well attended. Um, so, um, one thing we can notice is just what a conscientious parish priest he was. There's a diary of his activities just for 1897. It's held in the cathedral um, archives. And it records um, one morning he clocked up 13 visits in a morning. Can't have stayed long anywhere. Um, it records the way in which he um, was playing draft with the old man down at the benevolent institution there, uh, giving a talk on tips on successful living to um, the Literary and Social Club. He was pastorally diligent. And on Saturday night, he would come to the church to pray in preparation for Sunday, about an hour. And he would try and gather lay people to support that spiritual preparation. It was a spiritual revolution as well as a worship revolution. Well, the next thing he needed to do, let's come to the um, Ronaldsons now, was to get the Ronaldsons on the side. 
because, um, let's go, go to the next one, Wollaston's son, CJ, had been the superintendent of the Sunday school and his sister had been a Sunday school teacher and organist for the Sunday school. They'd resigned in high Dutch and when their dad was driven off the parish. Um, and let's just go to the next one, the amazing benevolent institution. This is actually a very favourable shot. This amazing workhouse was down the end of Eastbourne Street here. And you can see photographs of um, Victorian Cavisham which is standing there in all its Dickensian glory. This is um, actually, um, yes, a somewhat laundered version of the, of the Benevolent Institution. And Ronaldson had been, um, Neville created a job for him. You're, you're now the visitor to public institutions, and one of them was the Benny, as they called it, one, the industrial school up there, and the jail, of course, and the law courts and the hospital. But uh, Ronaldson was very angry and upset, and kept badgering the parish and the vestry during the time of the Reverend F. E. Watson, the hapless individual who comes between Ronaldson and King to get his money back for the hall. So, uh, first of all, King said to C.J., be the people's warden. No. Well, two years later, after much patient negotiation and a lot of um, deployment of these soft skills, he persuaded C.J. to become the superintendent of the Sunday school again. And then he opened negotiations with Ronaldson to try and resolve the hall debt issue. And to cut a long story short, he persuaded Ronaldson to, to, to mark the debt down to 250 pounds in return for a full and prompt payment of that. <coughs> so now, the Ronaldsons were so much on side that um, the Rip Ronaldson would take services here, although <coughs> King ruefully said in his 1897 diary he forgot to turn up for even song to preach, so I had to preach extempore. And when King came back from two long holidays, um, uh, the Reverend Ronaldson gave the effusive speech of welcome and re return to him. Um, Ronaldson, just a fascinating guy, he deserves a talk in his own right. A very extensive experience with Maori, he'd come here as a, as a seaman, he had a lot of farming experience in the North Island. So by the time the 20th century began, St Peter's was in a sweet spot. What's the next one? Yep. Um, uh, this is the Reverend E.L. Woodhouse, the curate the parish was now employing, who was particular um, the responsibility of what they called the Four Marie Mission, that would later become Holy Cross St Kilda. Uh, Woodhouse is actually commemorated in that stained glass window as you go through the link. He drowned in 1915, visiting friends in Balcluth. He was then the vicar of St Mary's Mornington, and it was a famous insurance case uh, in which the insurance company tried to get out of paying up on his life. You know, if this man foolishly tried to cross the railway bridge, we could we'd wash our hands of all responsibility. I won't go into that. Um, and by now, Vincent Brian King, the famous son of Brian King, was operating as a Sunday school superintendent and pastoral helper. We'll be coming to him soon. The parish now also had the assistance of Deaconess Sisters. So um, when, in 1911, King announced his intention to retire, um, he did so with a lot of um, goodwill and a generous provision of finance from the parish to top of his pension. He said, in 17 years of pastoral work in three colonies and four parishes, I've never had such overwhelming difficulties in this parish, but on the other hand, I've never had such promising and hopeful results. He had made these promising and hopeful results happen, and he died in 1915. Well, we're going to come on to the next the remarkable Edward Derry Evans that's come to the next image. I'm going to talk about the 1910 General Mission of Help. The Reverend T.H. Sprott was the vicar of St. Paul's Wellington, and he made a a speech to the Synod of the Wellington Synod and said, look, missions, even if they're citywide, have very localised effects because human beings sink back to the general level of thought and feeling in their daily habits. So the whole benefits evaporate after a few weeks and months. I've heard about this mission that's happened in South Africa with a team of visiting Church of England clergy who are specialists in mission. What we need to do is hit every parish in the country simultaneously. We'll, have, we'll bring these missioners in, and over a short period of time, we'll go to every Anglican parish, and we'll lift the whole national mood. And so this is the team that eventually came out. Two pioneers came out of, to, to be sort of spearhead the mission and said, I have bracing news for you, uh, New Zealand synods. 12 men aren't enough. You need to raise to 16. You're going to need to recruit local clergy to help, and raise a lot more money to pay for all this. Well, the idea had taken such hold that they agreed to this. Because with our, um, looking back now, that our ecumenical hindsight, how come 
these missions were only going to take place in Anglican parishes. Uh, was this kind of Anglican assumption where the premier Protestant denomination uh, didn't cover anybody else? And um, the thing to notice here, and my goodness, the number of times I've heard the word mission is a guilt inducing word in the long years of ministry. Um, the Edwardian church knew what to do about mission. They had, a, in modern parlance, a toolbox to address it. This guy here, Colville, he was a professional diocesan missioner to the Diocese of Hereford. He then went and did that in South Africa. He was then recruited by the Bishop of Auckland to be his missioner. He would become the Vicar of St Mary's New Plymouth. This photograph is taken outside St Mary's New Plymouth in 1910. And he would die in post as Vicar of um, in that parish that Sepulchre was kind of past uh, during the Great War. This man, Sedgwick, had come out from England in the early 20th century. He would become the fifth Bishop of Waiapu. Uh, this is Canon Wilford, uh, who created St George's Hospital in Christchurch. He's commemorated by Wilford House and College House. And here we have two Murfield fathers, Father Fitzgerald and Father Rees, who would go on to become the Bishop of Plandaff. Do any of you read the Church Times, that rather alarming article about the way in which these two, these three, were involved in occultist interests in the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, and the way in which Waiapu, Havelock North, became a hotbed of all this, this dangerous Gnostic cult, but I must not get diverted into this fascinating appalling subject. <laughs> <laughs> this man, uh, Canon Ivans, uh, uh, a well-known Anglo-Catholic, was renowned for his success with men, had packed men services, the Reverend Cyril Heffer, another advanced Anglo-Catholic, is not here. Well, of these missioners, nine Anglo-Catholics and five were Evangelicals. Mm -hmm. And this would have an impact. Mm -hmm. Well, the missioners arrived in Dunedin in November. Um, large parishes got an eight-day mission. Small parishes got a four-day mission. Uh, the very Anglo-Catholic missioners were sent to All Saints in St. Martin's North East Valley of the Cathedral. St. Peter's got the Reverend H. V. Jones, a moderate Anglo-Catholic. <laughs> but the one who made the most striking impression was a lay evangelist, Mr. J. Harris, who addressed meetings at the railway workshops and at the rope works and preached at St. Kilda Town Hall. According to the ODT, the service that he took on the Thursday evening stands out as one of the most striking features of the mission both in regard to the number of men present and the heartiness of the singing. But what really drew people's attention was something that had happened to the far south. Let's now go to... And um, let's, you know, can you just go back to the photo of the missionaries? Because I need to show you. Here we have Edward Daring Evans, who had arrived late. And he was going to take missions at Waimati and Riverton. Let's go to Riverton now. And um, it was a 14-day mission. There was only 1,000 people in Riverton. And he clearly had a flair for the dramatic. On the Saturday evening, he gathered 150 church people outside the church here for a short outdoor service. Just went there last week. You can actually get into this church quite easily because that wonderful museum is open just across the road and they've got the key. And the church is obviously in use and loved. It was built in 1902, 1903, not long before the mission. So let's go to the next image. And what they then did, um, he wanted to gather people up to go to the town hall Looks like a Wild West movie, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, the town hall, the old town hall was actually quite close to the church, very close. They must have gone down one side of the street, and then down the other side of the street, with a large red processional cross. And they'd hold at various points for short um, exhortations for people to follow the procession and go to the town hall. And night after night, the crowds grew. It wasn't just Anglicans and lapsed Anglicans that were attending. <laughs> Um, and and it, it drew newspaper reports from across Southland, and the mission was so successful it raised not just enough money to pay for the Riverton mission, but more funds were sent to the need to pay for the mission overall. And nominators at Caversham uh, took notice and asked Derek Evans to come to the parish. So, um, what's the next image we have? Is it good? Yep. Well, um, as soon as he arrived at St. Peter's uh, in 1911, he took a mission at Holy Cross St. Kilda with a record of intensive activities. He said to the Reverend J. Morland, the Vicar of Riverton, time for a return of favours, come and help me. There was open-air preaching, there were children's services, women's services, um, addresses to men, 
and he found the men's group there right away. He revitalised the men's group here at Caversham. He was the kind of guy who pressed buttons, start buttons, and then moved on. And this is the consecration service of Holy Cross St Kilda. And as you see, um, Derek Evans is the deacon, and he's got Neville dressed up to the nines and everything. Uh, and a very high standard of religion here. So now Holy Cross St Kilda was open for business. Um, uh, he also, um, one Sunday afternoon in January 1914, there were a lot of beachgoers and swimmers and what have you there, no, no surfs yet, um, suddenly they were startled to see a procession beginning from Pagetus Corner of Queen Alexander Street, rending its way onto the beach, where Evans conducted a short service and preached simple evangelical sermons, to which large numbers listened very attentively. Let's go to the next image. But the other thing that happened was the building and opening of the vicarage in 1913. These two tough looking characters in the front of the vicarage borders. This is um, Father Coates, the curate. I suspect this is the woman he married. He went on to become the vicar of Anderson. <coughs> His brother got killed at the Western Front in 1917 and he had a major nervous breakdown. And he, he recovered his mojo and went to the diocese of Auckland where he spent his entire life in ministry. Here's Derry Evans, but there's something a bit puzzling about this that I can't figure out. Let's go to the next image and I'll show you why I'm puzzled. <coughs> Here's Edward Derry with a Beretta and a Cope. Let's go back again. These clergy are dressed in serum cassocks and Canterbury caps. Mm. Well, there's two strands in ritualism at this stage. There's the let's not ape Romans. Let's not ape Rome. We'll copy the style of what we think went on in English religion in the high Middle Ages based on the cathedral at Salisbury. This is what we think with the outdoor dress. Percy Dermer said all this in the Parsons Handbook. We wear button-up cassocks, you wear a belt and a Canterbury cap. Well, Darren Evans has now gone full Roman. But we know this, um, uh, let's go to the next image. This is not outside St. Peter's. I wonder if this was taken in America. Because what happened was that in 1914, he went to America. He was a, a remarkable guy. He had an American father. He was the first vicar here to be trained at the Theological College, Lincoln Theological College. These were considered to be newfangled inventions and rather dangerously like Roman seminaries. And um, he became the curate of a church in Baltimore that had 1,200 members. Then he became the vicar. And then he married a millionaire's daughter, Helen Fisk, in 1917 at the great Anglo-Catholic shrine of, um, of St. Mary's 46th Street, isn't it? And there were four bishops in attendance at an actual mass, including the Bishop of Fond du Lac, the suffragan Bishop of uh, New York, coadjutor bishop, who was a relative of the Fisk family. Uh, there was the Governor General of Canada, the Marquis and Marchioness of Aberdeen, um, and her father, uh, gave the Golden Doors at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine, New York. He was a strong supporter of St. Mary's. Uh, he, was, he, wrote, he was the executive director of an insurance company. Well, his wife Helen had many mystical and olfactory experiences. I had not known what an olfactory experience was until I studied this. Apparently, this is where you don't just see mystical things, you smell them as well. He had mystical, she had mystical visions of St. Therese of Lisieux, who had died in the 19th century in France just a few years before. Mystical versions of Jesus in the tabernacle and of um, the Blessed Virgin Mary. And the head of the Society of St. John the Evangelist in America encouraged her to write all these visions down in a little book that was called The Garden of the Little Flower and Other Mystical Experiences. And um, Derry Evans had itchy feet. He never stayed anywhere for long. Went back to England, was uh, briefly vicar of a parish in Exeter, vicar of a parish called Mamhead in rural Exeter. Um, he was briefly uh, canon of the Falkland Islands and a mission, uh, uh, in Chile as a missionary. Um, the Second World War found him in a church in the Diocese of Southwark where the Luftwaffe bombed him out. And uh, he died in the early 1950s in the West Country. Well, why did he have such itchy feet? So there's a clue. When he went away in 1912 for 16, six months to recruit some new clergy from England and find some assuage the grumpy feelings of his former English parish in, in, um, in, in England, he said this. He began a few words to say about the way of work which you've been carrying on during the past months. There have been lots of very strenuous work, full of anxiety. 
done since he came here last March. He had been helped through it all in spite of fits of depression by the great kindness shown to him. Now, my theory is there are some clergy with um, underlying depressive personalities. They work in power bursts of enthusiasm, then they lapse into long, somber periods of being down, and then they go on to the next challenge. You know, I'm bored to tears, on to the next thing, I suspect. He was like this. What a guy, though, what an interesting wife. <laughs> Let's now go to the next picture. Well, this photograph's in the sacristy. This is Father John Mortimer, surrounded by his service, uh, who are part of the girls of the service of the sanctuary, a very famous sodality. Anglo Catholic parishes love this. And let's look at some of the characters here. Here's Edward McCleavy, who would go on to be ordained and become the vicar of St. Barnabas, Rose Neath, and would establish its reputation as the Anglo Catholic shrine of the Diocese of Wellington. And this, of course, is Stan Hurd. Let's go to Stan, the man. Who would become ordained and would serve his entire ministry in the Diocese of Dunedin. And he begat Michael Hurd, a very successful vicar of St. Michael's Anderson's Bay, and a very successful dean of Nelson Cathedral, who in turn begat Tim Hurd. So he stands with the establishment of a clerical dynasty. So this is the third of the triad of clergy who will submit in the Oxford movement at... Um, at uh, What's the next image now? Um, Mortimer had come out with Canon Burton, the man who changed the world at St. Michael's Christchurch and made it the premier Anglo Catholic parish of New Zealand. He was a missioner in the Diocese of St. Albans. He was said of him that he emptied St. Michael's out and filled it up again <laughs> with a different kind of Anglican. He was another hit-and-run man. He was only there for three or four years. I love the sardonic smile on his face. Um, uh, I think there was a... There was, um, yes, that coat was given to him by St. Michael's parishioner. Well, Father Mortimer was the son-in-law of Burton. He married one of his daughters. Came up to be part of the change team. He was then made um, the vicar... Oh, Churchill Judge proposed to present him to the living of St. Matthew's... Um, let's get this right. St Albans East, which had been split off from the parish of St Matthew St Albans, and immediately a section of parishioners objected to the well-known ritualism of their new vicar, or Churchill Julia stood by him and insisted the appointment went ahead. You know, God's got a great sense of humour. This is the parish that became St Stephen Shirley. And as we all know, St Stephen Shirley has just broken away from the Anglican Church under the leadership of its vicar, J. Bean. Uh, who's likely to be consecrated the first GAFCON missionary bishop of New Zealand later this year. Well, this parish of St. Shirley had an Anglo-Catholic beginning. We'll come back to this kind of reverse churchmanship later when we talk about St. Matthew's to Neiman. Um, well, um, Mortimer had... Um, go to the image of him alone. Had a... Um, oh, do we have Yes, this is the one. He um, had a degree in economics from Oxford. He'd been trained at St. Stephen's House, Oxford, arguably the most extreme Anglo-Catholic theological going. Uh, he was also a poet. He wrote um, Christmas mystery plays. Um, what else did he do? Um, his, his intellectual background was certainly key because the one thing the Cavisham Project has made it clear is that Cavisham came into existence as an industrial suburb, having never ever been anything <laughs> else before. And problems of labour were a big issue. Um, look at those eyes. Very thin man, um, very ill health. He died of consumption in 1920. Maybe not a good idea to come to such a smoky parish. But it wasn't just the gas works down there, it was gas works up here on South Road, where the old St. Peter's had been, and out there in Kensington, a formidable railway shunting yard. You've got to imagine this suburb has been just full of smoke pollution all the time. So, um, he, um, let's go to the next image. His intellectual background, oh no, this looks not wanting, can get that one? Yes. <coughs> This book came out in the late 19th century and it burst like a bombshell on the, um, on the Christian scene. 
It was a collection of essays by Anglo-Catholic theologians presided over by the famous Bishop Gore, who had established the community for resurrection in Murphy and become the Bishop of Oxford. It addressed issues that thoughtful, sensitive, intelligent Christians had become very worried about. The rise of German biblical criticism. What are we to make of Darwin's solution? And what about the problems of living in an advanced industrial society with, with increasingly um, conflicted labor relations? Lux Mundi had offered a solution to all those. It, it had an impact way outside the Anglican world. Uh, Rutherford Waddell was a fan of it, for instance. Um, there was a Fabian society existed in Dunedin at the same time. So um, let's move on to the uh, next image and the next one. Uh, yes, when he died, he was said to be universally loved by all parishioners. So he's the only vicar who's ever had a stained glass window named after him. Can we find the um, Unionists in the Oval? He was a Christian socialist and he founded um, the Christian Social uh, League in Christchurch. And um, Father Money, who was the curate of Polish from the Avonside, was the secretary. In the 1913 Littleton waterfront strike, he went out to address the workers. We're on your side. Keep going. Make sure it doesn't turn into violence, but uh, we're all for you. And he put a, up a motion to the Christchurch to us and Synod that will raise a lot of interest. The press, never a great fan of progressive causes, wrote <laughs> an editorial on red-fed Christianity, commenting on these two clergy. And this gave him a great opportunity to jump into the correspondence columns. This isn't the war the little front, little front strike, it's the Oval of Dunedin, actually. But um, uh, what Mortimer achieved with two things in this time. In 1917, he gave the go-ahead for Holy Cross and killed her to become an independent parish, and that was a very good idea because it reduced the burden on Mortimer's curates, it encouraged the Anglicans in Holy Cross and Kilda to become much more energised in terms of their um, mission work, and um, it, it, it um, was the beginnings, arguably this is what should have happened, some people less than clear, I digress. The other thing he did was to give a series of um, lectures on guild socialism in the hall here, in 1918. These attracted huge turnouts of working men and a very appreciative response. And how can I sum this up briefly? We gave a conference at Murfield a few weeks about Neville Figure CR, one of the great social theoreticians of the time, who was talking about the need for intermediate institutions between the state and the individual. And what Mortimer was recommending was a kind of revival of the medieval guilds, only more so, more, more like 20th century syndicalism. A guild would control a particular craft or skill area of the industrial economy, recruit and set standards for apprentices. Uh, it would, um, it would um, work up the pay scales and would supervise those who were competent to do the job. They wouldn't own the means of production or the factories, but they would negotiate directly with the government. And this attracted a lot of support. When he said, though, you should stay at the arbitration courts, that wasn't popular. Let me just quickly say two things. One thing about trade unionism in New Zealand in this era. There were two streams, the craft unions, that dominated here in Dunedin. We're just here for the pay and conditions for the workers, nothing else. And the red feds in Auckland, based on American models, we're here to transform society, to take over, on behalf of labour, the means of production and the accumulation of capital. Calling somebody a red fed was a very uh, incendiary thing to call them. Uh, so um, when uh, the, the craft unions here were very keen on the arbitration system of the Liberal government, so that wasn't a popular thing. Well, Mortimer went out and gave an abridged version of this lecture at uh, Port Chalmers, but his ill health got him after that, and he um, took leave of absence, went to Christchurch in 1920 and died there. Let's go to the next image, one after that, and one after that. Uh, his requiem was, of course, was St. Michael's. He's buried in the Burwood Cemetery. Next one. What about his wife? She was left with three kids. Uh, and she went back to England and she established a dance school. And she got together with another woman who was very good uh, as a dance instructor. They must have got some cash from somewhere. And they established this school called Elmhurst at Camberley. Uh, it was a boarding school for girls. It trained them to be dancers and eventually went on to become a primary feeder for many of the 
premier dance companies and ballet companies of England. One of her sons became ordained, she created a very anglo catholic chapel there, appointed him the um, chaplain. So, young woman here went to the school to be um, trained how to be trained dancers and advanced anglo catholics I find this utterly admirable. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think this is one of the things I want to say about ritualism, at its best, although it's always been a minority movement within the Anglican Church, it's exhibited a creativity and a generativity that sort of punched above its weight. She died in the 1950s, and uh, her death was recorded in the parish mag here. Remarkable woman. Let's move. Oh, I guess just one final, final point. We can be amused at the kind of medi quaint medievalism of talking about guild socialism. We can be amused about them talking about how Henry VIII had to put the rot on, you know, by creating proto-capitalists out of those who had seized the monasteries. But in the interwar year era. Um, anglo Catholics created what was called the Christian Sociology Movement. People like V.A. DeMant and Morris Rickett were very involved in that. Thinking hard about how to resolve the issues of industrial civilization in Britain. This in turn was endorsed by the Christendom Group, um, sponsored by T.S. Eliot. And um, this in turn influenced the COPEC Conference. And this in turn influenced William Temple's widely read and much admired book, Christianity and Social Order, which is held to be one of the major tap roots of the welfare state and the thinking of the Labour government when it came to power in 1945. Now we come to Vincent Bryan King, the remarkable son of Bryan King. This is the opening of the Vauxhall Boys Orphanage. Uh, and let's look at some of the characters here. This is Vincent Bryan King, this thin, cadaverous creature who was Bishop Chaplin. Here's Father Mortimer. This is some um, Deans Ritchie went on to become a prominent member of the financial and business community of Dunedin, died in 1942, and as Ovid said, how deeply influenced me by Father Mortimer. He changed his life and influenced him in so many ways. Um, and uh, Vincent Brian King had started off as superintendent of the Sunday School here. He had uh, been helper at the Aubrey Mission. He was ordained a deacon in 1904 and appointed to visit the public institutions. Uh, his priesting didn't occur to 1909, but he got very close to the Nevilles, because when the first Mrs. Neville died in 1905, she left him, what was a thousand pounds, I'll just find that out. Um, Two thousand pounds, because it was six or seven years stipend for a reasonably remunerated vicar. Uh, he was also uh, president of the City Relief Association, chairman of the Red Cross and the St. John Ambulance Association, a member of the Society for the Protection of Women, on the executive of the Hospital Saturday Association, and children of brigade chaplain to the Boys Scout Organization. Well, uh, as we will be hearing, he had problems drawing boundaries around himself and knowing when to take a rest. Let's go for the next image. Uh, perhaps his most notable creation was the Men's Mission House in Fiddle Street in uh, 18... It reported to the Liverpool Arms had lost its license in 1894 and had become one of the most unsavoury houses in Dunedin. In King's words, it had become tenanted by rogues, vagabonds, gamblers and half-caste Chinese girls. It was filthily dirty. When it was being cleaned, the accumulation of years had to be scraped off the floor with spades. In an upstairs room, 12 or 14 ferrets had been kept and looked after their removal. They remained in their vicinity in odour that forcibly reminded them of the Polcat tribe. Well, um, hard to believe that Fiddle Street was the area of roughs and toughs. Very violent place to go there. Which you had to, the police said, don't do it. Do not open your mission house here. You are going to bring major trouble on yourself. And surely, he was helped by the way, the brother of St Andrew, um, idealistic, altruistic, young Anglican men, in a sort of service order. The idea of coming from America had been sponsored by Neville. Well, um, the roughs and toughs did come to the mission house in the first few weeks and smashed up all the furniture. And a series of encounters took place between Vincent Bryan King and them. Despite his ill health, despite his thin, cadaverous body, he had one advantage. He was an expert in unarmed combat. He was an expert in jiu-jitsu, as was then called, I assume that's what we now call judo. And in these trials of strength and skill, he prevailed against all those who had invaded the mission house. And the one particular special encounter that took place was a burly docker, a very big man who refused to leave the house at closing time 
and uh, we, you know, let's take, it a, take this one outside Padre. He was um, thrown out in a judo throw. And the journalist who was interviewing Vincent Bryan King about all this was put in a, a hold of both of his arms up behind his back in a, in a flash. So um, the mission house was, uh, you could, uh, meals were served there. Um, there was a room to write letters and read magazines. Uh, it worked as something of an employment agency for people. Um, there was some accommodation offered. Um, there was a service on Sunday evening. Uh, and this went on until 1944. It was closed then. Um, King was also very adept at spotting the difference between scroungers and professional panhandlers and people in genuine need. His name appeared with dreary frequency. But like, don't just give money indiscriminately to people on the street, beggars. Be exercise wisdom and discernment. His name appeared with dreary frequency in the courts on behalf of uh, deserted and abandoned wives and men who weren't paying their, their support payments to kids. Um, but his, he really came into his own when the 1918 influenza pandemic came. Yes. Um, what happened was that you know, the, the pandemic moved down through New Zealand from November on and been brought back by servicemen. And it, people knew it was coming, so Dr. Irwin Ferris, the district health officer, took it upon himself to bypass the mayor and directly approach the king in his capacity as head of the local Red Cross and St. John Ambulance Association to be the chief's, <laughs> the city's chief organizer of the relief effort. So King took over the um, Red Cross shop uh, in the um, in the uh, which building was this in the or post office building, and he developed a bureau of several hundred volunteers. Um, he was answerable only to Dr. Ferris. In effect, became the flu czar of Dunedin. The mayor and the town clerk came down with the flu. They were out of it. These images, I think, are taken from Jeffrey Rice's famous book on the. Influenza pandemic. Jeffrey Rice taught me the Crusades you know, in my MA year at Canterbury. He's making an amazing mistake in this book. He, he attributes uh, this, these relief efforts to, to Vincent Bryan King's father, who had died in 1915. Remarkable mistake for a professional historian. Uh, there were some very wacko ideas about what you did to try and save people from getting the flu. Uh, this is the old hospital, and there were hundreds of cars were sent out every day to households where people had come down with the flu. Uh, King got stuck into fruiterism to need who claimed were raising the price on citrus fruits, which were a key thing that people did to try and save themselves. And um, Dunedin was fortunate having just over half the death toll of Christchurch and was the least affected of the four centres. 701 flu victims were admitted to Dunedin Hospital, 530 which were pneumonic, with 172 deaths resulting. The worst day came on the 26th of November when 16 people died. What got people really scared about the flu pandemic is that usually when viral things come, it's the very old and the very young who died. In this one, it was the young and the fit who died. And when they died, their skin often turned black or blue. Because what had happened was that oxygen had been coming out of their capillaries. And that really scared people. St. Peter's Cavish and Parishioners, Grandma Lil Bedford, she actually caught the flu as a baby. And uh, she was saved by a devoted nursing. The nurse took her away from her family and said, I'll look after her. So um, the people of Dunedin were so grateful to King that they gave him a motor car and a thousand pounds. And in subsequent years, uh, he uh, organized, he was very involved in the Monticello War Veterans Home, showed the Prince of Wales and the King around in the 1920s. He, um, in the floods of 1920, 23 in the big one in the South Sea in 1929. He was a house to house visitor. Uh, he was very involved in relief work for unemployed men. He would say things are very bad in 1926. In 1929, he would say, Never in his 25 years' experience have he seen such hardship in the city. Well, he kept having breakdowns uh, because of his overwork. Uh, 23, 24, and 26. The worst one was in 1930. His wife had died that year. He was given six months to leave, he went back to England, visited St George's in the East with his son, Mayrick Brian King, who was also ordained. I'll just say a word about him in a minute. Uh, King retired in 1943, the Mission House closed in 1944, and he died in 1945. 
Mayor Vincent Bryan King was ordained in 1948, but would really function an ordained ministry being of a neurasthenic disposition. When he died in 1988, his tombstone in Broad Bay Cemetery read, in memory of Mayor Vincent Bryan King, 1912-1988 priest, Psalm 31 verse 7, I will rejoice because thou hast taken heed of my adversities. Well, the Truth newspaper, which is not a great fan of the church, or its kind of clergy, <laughs> wrote a, an extended panegyric about King, called him the King of, of, all, of all men. It just praised him for all that he had done. Uh, and that's perhaps the most fitting um, tribute to him. I'm going to conclude now, um, just as well. Um, how is it that a movement fiercely opposed in the 1870s and 1880s had become the kind of way in which, um, by the interwar period, Dunedin Diocese was known for its moderate Anglo-Catholic ethos. A transformation had occurred. How would this come about? How would this happen? Well, um, the three ministries I talked about Cavisham, uh, part of the story, and this parish has never gone back on the Oxford movement. There have been some clergy would be less enthusiastic about it, less energetic, but it's, the revolution has never been repealed. I think under Roger Taylor it became much more propelled in the 1950s. And of course it could be argued from 1986 on the parish received full Catholic privileges from the time of the ministry of Father Carl Somersetka and rose to its apogee. So um, I, I think the Lux Mundi revolution is part of why things changed. And look at it, it seized the kind of theological high ground now. The movement had entered into its third phase, that of what we call liberal Anglo-Catholicism. It was addressing major issues of the day. It was now becoming respectable in the Anglican Communion. The other thing, I think, was the establishment of Selwyn College. Let's go to the next image. I'll be back. No, okay. What the state of Kirby says. L.G. Whitehead had been come the um, head of, well, and I'll come to him later on. The ordinance, I think, tended to be of a high church disposition, partly because of the cachet and daring of being um, part of the, end of the high church thing. Um, and L.G. Whitehead had a long stay ministry from 1919 to 1950 at um, Selwyn College. He was vicar also of all saints from 1935 to 1948. And he described himself in this way. Although I had what we called an evangelical upbringing from my parents, I was an Anglo Catholic at the school of Bishop Gore, but I was very interested in the modernist movement in the Roman Catholic Church, and my views later became those of Tyrrell, von Hugel, and to some extent Dean Hing. But the war also had a devastating effect on my mind. Hitherto I had, like most people in those days, believed that not only was our civilization secure, but that real progress was inevitable. The horror of disillusion me. In 1913, I read Neville Figgis' book, Civilization at the Crossroads, with its solemn warnings. If they disturbed me, I comforted myself with the thought that the crash would not come in our time. What an interesting guy L.G. Whitehead is. He's a son of a Kyapoi bookseller, an autodidact, um, who became a formidable intellectual. He and Father Mortimer had read the French philosopher Henri Bergson's book, Creative Evolution, in, in the original French. They were friends together. Um, let's now, um, I think the 1910 general mission had left its mark. The confraternity of the resurrection was left behind at the cathedral by Father Fitzgerald and Father Rees. Uh, Deaconess religious sisters became established part of All Saints team and also here at Cavisham. Uh, so ritualistic sisterhoods were now acceptable. Let's, and of course, they founded the Sisters of the Church St. Hilda's. Incidentally, Sister Ethelene had grown up in the Neville household as part of the extended family. Uh, and that left, a, people were very impressed by the fact that the Sisters of the Church had created St. Hilda's. Let's now look at the final image. Go to go back to one. Bishop Neville himself. The accusations against Neville of ritual sympathies and of high church tendencies have not been without foundation. Keenly aware of Jenna's fate, he had downplayed that aspect of his Anglican identity for many years, but as the 20th century dawned, he had several decades of Episcopal rule under his belt, and he was now the primate, and he feared no one. 
uh, after this elevation to that role in 1904. And I think that photograph tells the story. All right, Derry Evans had egged them on to dress up to the nines like this. But I think he was enjoying it. <laughs> and he was finally able to show himself in his true colours. And finally, this is a unique Anglican diocese of being surrounded by the sea of Presbyterianism. It's the, one of the few dioceses that voted against church union. And I think that may have helped to solidify you know, his desire to have a very strong sense of Anglican ethos and identity to stand for something. So, that's it. Can I just say a quick bit about books? For those studying Anglo-Catholicism and ritualism, there's been a, some very good books come out recently. This is one by John Shelton Reed, Glorious Battle, an American sociologist, who compares the pioneering ritualists to the American youth movement of the 1960s. These are people out looking for trouble. They believed that um, <laughs> bad news was not bad news, it was good news, it brought you publicity but he's got a detailed analysis of many of the London ritualist parishes. This has just come out, the Oxford Handbook of the Oxford Movement. Mm -hmm. um, it does focus rather relentlessly on Oxford and the Tractarians, but it's got some amazing articles in it. And this series of books, the Oxford History of Anglicanism, amazing they persuaded OUP to produce this series. And the editor is Rowan Strong, a New Zealand Anglican priest who teaches in Western Australia. And this volume three, about partisan Anglicanism and its global expansion is particularly helpful because he argues that the competition between evangelicals and Anglo Catholics wasn't a bad thing, it helped the production of kind of mission energies in the church. Okay, that's it. You're right from morning tea, you can ask me questions at morning tea.